Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. This week, several outlets, including U.S.-based The Wall Street Journal, report that China's surge of low-cost goods flooding developing economies is escalating trade tensions, complicating Beijing's efforts to build alliances as it faces growing tension with the United States. As President-elect Donald Trump vows to ramp up tariffs on China, Beijing is eyeing the global South, countries like Indonesia, Brazil, and Pakistan, as alternative markets to absorb its excess production. However, many of these nations are pushing back against the influx of Chinese imports, which threaten local industries' jobs and efforts to develop domestic manufacturing. Many developing nations have hoped to build their manufacturing sectors as a path to economic advancement, much in the same way that China has done over the last three decades. Yet Chinese exports, particularly in low-end products like textiles, steel, and toys, undercut local businesses, making it harder for these economies to develop their industries. In Thailand, for example, over 1,700 factories closed between early 2023 and the first quarter of 2024 as cheap Chinese goods flooded the market, according to KKP Research. In response, numerous countries have imposed trade defense measures, including tariffs and investigations into Chinese practices. Showcasing that trade protectionism against China is not just a phenomenon in the developed world, and undermining Beijing's claims that there is no overcapacity issue and that this is all just a Western ploy to keep China down. Brazil, a key member of the BRICS group, has raised tariffs on Chinese auto parts, telecommunications equipment, and steel, despite strong diplomatic ties with Beijing. Similarly, Indonesia has banned the Timu app, which connects consumers directly to Chinese factories, citing concerns over predatory pricing that harms local businesses. These reactions highlight growing frustrations with China's dominance in global trade through massive industrial support and domestic imbalances. However, on the other hand, Chinese exports remain crucial for poorer consumers in the global south. Who benefit from affordable goods? Peking University professor of finance Michael Pettis lays out the numbers in a post this week, expressing, "Quote: This is an intractable problem of simple arithmetic. China represents 17% of global GDP and 30% of global manufacturing. Its current growth model requires that it increases its share further. The U.S. represents 23% of global GDP and only 17% of global manufacturing. Like other advanced economies with persistent deficits." Its share of global manufacturing has declined. That's why it is taking steps to reverse this decline and raise its manufacturing share of GDP. But if the two economies, who collectively comprise nearly half of global manufacturing, both try to increase their manufacturing shares, this requires that all other countries reduce their own manufacturing shares to accommodate them. Not surprisingly, neither the EU nor most developing economies are interested in playing that role. So something must break. We cannot all raise or maintain our shares of global manufacturing. This is just arithmetic. End quote. Now, before we move on to the next few developments, there is something I wanted to quickly say. I think for most regular viewers and long-time viewers,、uh, they will know this already, but it's worth repeating. China Update is my attempt to follow and understand as best I can what is happening in this large and complex country called China, and then share this with you, the viewers who want to come along on the journey. My objective is to understand. This is not a punditry show. This is not a anti-China or pro-China expedition. It is simply an attempt to understand. Over the last few years, China has been going through a difficult time with its economy. Because of this, much of the economic coverage has been largely negative. However, if things turned around tomorrow, the coverage would reflect this as well. As I have discussed as well in previous videos, unfortunately, on YouTube, one has to use more provocative thumbnails in order to be shown to new viewers, and so thumbnails often reflect this. But videos will always remain grounded. Now, the reason I am saying this is for new viewers to know that this is not an anti-China channel, and so if you're looking for an anti-China channel, this is not it. I also say it because today's episode is going to be rather critical of China. This is not intentional. It is just the most salient developments which we need to cover. I don't want viewers to think that China update generally or this episode specifically is here to bash China. It's just simply what we need to cover. As positive stories emerge, these will be covered as well. But for today's video, it's quite heavy and quite critical. Now, with that said. Let's jump in. Next up, once again, we are seeing renewed tensions between U.S. military ally the Philippines and China in the South China Sea. 
What we are watching here is video filmed yesterday and released by the Philippines Coast Guard. The largest ship is the Chinese vessel. Yesterday, Wednesday, a China Coast Guard vessel water cannoned and then sideswiped a Philippines Fisheries Bureau boat near the disputed Scarborough Shoal. Beijing accused the Philippines boat of being at fault, with state media writing that, quote, the Philippine vessel intentionally rammed into a China Coast Guard ship in waters around China's Huangyan on Wednesday. End quote. This is the Chinese name for the Scarborough Shoal. Now, despite this claim, I think the video makes clear who was the provocative actor in this exchange. The Manila Fisheries Bureau boat was on its way to deliver supplies to Filipino fishermen in the area, according to the Philippines officials. The incident follows a diplomatic spat in November after China drew baseline territorial waters around the prime fishing patch of the Scarborough Shoal and submitted nautical charts this week to the United Nations, setting out its claim, which Manila said was, quote, baseless and illegal, end quote. A Philippine Coast Guard spokesperson in a press conference yesterday released the video clip showing the larger Chinese Coast Guard ship approaching the smaller fisheries vessel until they collided, expressing, quote, this is actually overkill, end quote. Meanwhile, the same day, the China Coast Guard warned the Philippines to, quote, immediately halt its infringements, provocations and inflammatory actions, otherwise the Philippines will be held accountable for all consequences arising from this. End quote. State run the Global Times writes today, quote, using water cannon to restrict the Philippine vessel's intrusion into Chinese territorial waters should be considered restrained, and should the Philippines insist on going down the wrong path, China could be forced to take even stronger measures. End quote. In a separate article, the same outlet writes, quote, the Philippines has consistently provoked China in the South China Sea, emboldened by its perceived support from the U.S. End quote. Next up, we have two more developments to cover, but just quickly, if you're getting some value from today's episode, don't forget to hit the like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing is a tremendous help. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are also in the description for those who want to help keep the channel financially sustainable. Next up, the New York Times has published another big story about world anti-doping agency WADA failing to properly handle suspected doping by PRC swimmers. The latest report called Anti-Doping Agency Throws Out Investigators Who Warned About China makes fairly serious allegations. Quote, In the middle of 2020, the World Anti-Doping Agency's investigative unit sent the agency's top officials a report containing a stark warning based on an interview it had conducted with a doctor who had worked in China's sports ministry. The doctor claimed that China had been running a state-backed doping program for decades a potential nightmare scenario for the Olympic movement, which was still recovering from a Russian doping scandal that had rocked the games. And while the doctor's information was years old, she had defected in 2017, it was specific. Among the ways Chinese athletes were cheating, she said, was by taking undetectable amounts of a little-known prescription heart medication, TMZ, which can help increase stamina, endurance and recovery. The investigative unit's decision to pass its warning up to the agency's leaders was unusual, and the unit put China on a special watch list of countries to receive extra scrutiny, given the concerns raised by the doctor who, the investigators felt, was credible. The report proved prescient. Seven months after it was submitted to the anti-doping agency's leaders, 23 elite Chinese swimmers tested positive for TMZ, after competing at a national meet in China. But when the agency, known as WADA, learned of the positive tests, top leaders did not crack down on China. Instead, they sidelined the investigative unit, choosing not to tell its investigators and analysts that the swimmers had tested positive, ensuring the matter would not be looked into any further. The Justice Department and the FBI have opened an investigation into how the anti-doping authorities and sports officials allowed the Chinese swimmers to escape scrutiny. This week, WADA disclosed to its executive board that the Justice Department had requested all files it had related to the positive Chinese tests, including Chinese anti-doping officials' decision to not discipline the swimmers, according to a person familiar with the matter. But WADA told its executive board that it declined to produce the documents because it would set a dangerous precedent. End quote. And on the topic of a potential cover-up, we now move on to what could well be the cover-up of the century. 
if not one of the largest cover-ups in human history. That is, if a new report published this week by the U.S. House of Representatives is correct. This week, the U.S. House of Representatives Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic issued a report after a two-year investigation into the pandemic, concluding that, quote, COVID-19 most likely emerged from a laboratory, that's laboratory for our U.S. viewers, in Wuhan, China, end quote. Now, for many viewers, this may feel like a oh-you-don't-say moment, with the exception of the first year or so when, disgracefully, it was censored in mainstream Anglophone discourse. The lab leak hypothesis has been a popular explanation globally. However, this report is important as it makes the pandemic origin explanation official, in the US at least, and as such gives it a much higher degree of legitimacy. The question of the origins of COVID may once again feature more prominently in US-China relations. Let us quote the report. Quote, COVID-19 most likely emerged from a laboratory in Wuhan, China. The five strongest arguments in favor of the lab leak theory include 1. The virus possesses a biological characteristic that is not found in nature. 2. Data shows that all COVID-19 cases stem from a single introduction into humans. This runs contrary to previous pandemics where there were multiple spillover events. 3. Wuhan is home to China's foremost SARS SARS research lab, which has a history of conducting gain-of-function research at inadequate biosafety levels. 4. Wuhan Institute of Virology, WIV, researchers were sick with a COVID-like virus in the fall of 2019, months before COVID-19 was discovered at the wet market. 5. By nearly all measures of science, if there was evidence of a natural origin, it would have already surfaced. End quotes. If accurate, the implications of this report would be that China created and then covered up a spillover resulting in a global pandemic, killing tens of millions of people and costing tens, if not hundreds, of trillions of dollars, perhaps making it one of the biggest government cover-ups of all time. For obvious reasons, China strongly denies any of this, saying there is absolutely no scientific evidence to make the claim. In response to this report, People's Republic of China Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Jian expressed at a press event yesterday, quote, The so-called report by the U.S., without any substantial evidence, came up with a suggestive, misguided conclusion to frame and throw mud at China. This is a repetition of the old playbook of using the issue of origins tracing for political manipulation. There is nothing credible about that so-called conclusion, end quote. Lin then even went on to claim that COVID could have come from a cover-up in the United States. Quote, the U.S. should stop keeping mum about the questions concerning U.S. role in the pandemic and respond as quickly as possible to the international community's legitimate concerns. Voluntarily share its data with the WHO about suspected early cases in the U.S. Disclose what's going on at Fort Detrick and U.S. biological labs all over the world, and give a responsible explanation to the world. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. I know it was a heavy one, but thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for watching today's episode. I hope you can have a good Thursday, and I will see you all tomorrow.